Qumran on the Dead Sea is a desolate place. Here, after lying undisturbed for 2,000 years, a great library was found, an unimaginable treasure of parchment and papyrus, which came to be known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, works that have unrivaled importance for understanding the history of Jewish and Christian thought. For 2,000 years, the scrolls lay hidden, rolled in jars. From the moment they were discovered in 1947 in the caves above Qumran, controversy has raged about who wrote them, when they were written, and where they were written. Now, for the first time, scientists have been able to resolve some of the questions which have troubled the scholars for 50 years. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the greatest find of ancient Jewish documents ever made. They have a central place in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem and in Jewish life. They've become objects of wonder and awe. And they come from an era of which little was known, and only a few tiny scraps of papyrus existed before they were found. They are the oldest known Hebrew version of the Bible, a Bible which does not vary greatly from the text used today. And they're also the rules of a lost community, thought to be the Essenes, who are believed to have lived here at Qumran for more than 200 years, up to and including the time of Christ. For reasons unknown, they left Jerusalem for this tract of desert between towering cliffs and the intensely saline waters of the Dead Sea. When they moved here, they turned their back on the Jewish holiest place, the temple, of which only the huge slabs of the Western Wall remain. The community seemed to have left Jerusalem after disputes with the ruling priesthood to found a more strictly religious society. Their written commentaries on the prophets make clear that they considered themselves the true sons of Israel. For the Essenes, the temple was central to the Essene understanding of the proper constitution of Israel. But the temple as it was in their days, they rejected, the high priesthood they rejected, and they moved to the other side of this mountain ridge. This mountain ridge, of which the Mount of Olives is one end, is the watershed between the Judean desert and the hills of Judea leading down to the coastal plain. This desert had always been a place of withdrawal and spiritual renewal, a place to prepare for the coming of the Messiah which the prophets had foretold. And scholars have assumed that it was here, in a monastic community, that the sect wrote and studied its parchment and papyrus scrolls. The major scrolls are visited by hundreds of thousands every year and travel on display to all corners of the world. The scrolls have a powerful attraction because, despite the uncertainties about their authors, they seem to lie at the very heart of Western beliefs. In some way, I would say that the people, when they come into the shrine, come to be in touch with antiquity. The magic of the scrolls is that just by paying a look at the scrolls, in some way you are transported 2,000 years ago. And in some way you are in touch with people, human beings like us, who lived in the land of Israel 2,000 years ago, and maybe that some of them even met Jesus in Jerusalem.
The maybe scrolls still in private hands or buried in remote hills, which will cast light on the community. To this day, pieces occasionally find their way to the Israel Museum. It is really exciting to see a fragment for the first time. And when I recall the traditional story, when the Bedouins uh, discovered the scrolls in the caves, and you think that, ah, that's a pity that I was not part of that story. And today I see myself that in the 90s, I am part of this story. Although it's a world apart from Jerusalem, Qumran is less than 20 miles away. For 200 years, the members of the community waited here for the end of days, when they would inherit the kingdom. In 68 AD, they're believed to have hidden the scrolls above Qumran as the Roman legions of Vespasian approached, placing them first in these jars. But there is no hard evidence for this theory, which is drawn from the descriptions of the Essenes and their lives left by the ancient writers Josephus, Pliny, and Philo of Alexandria. Now attention is being turned to fresh scientific examinations of Qumran and the scrolls themselves. Nothing much remains of the Essenes, yet it seems that in these scattered and simple graves above the Dead Sea, there are still clues that were ignored in the excitement of discovery and translation. The scrolls have always been more than historical objects. They are steeped in religious and political significance, and so excited fierce competition. Fixing their exact place in ancient biblical literature was of paramount importance. Some of the scrolls were acquired by Professor Sukanik for the new state of Israel. But the bulk of the material was given into the care of a group of scholars and archaeologists, led by Father Roland de Vaux, at the French biblical school, the École Biblique, in Jerusalem, then a part of Jordan. Throughout the 50s, de Vaux excavated the site at Qumran and removed some bones from the cemetery. He also decided that this was indeed an Essene settlement. For 40 years, the scholars of the École Biblique studied the material without allowing access to outsiders. This led to charges that the scrolls contained material unfavorable to Christianity and that they were being suppressed by the Vatican. Father Emil Puech, an acclaimed scholar, has worked here for 30 years. It's written uh, on the popular books. I know that even I am accused myself to be a spy of the, of the Vatican, but I never met anybody from the Vatican coming here and saying, no, don't do that and do that. I think this is crazy, but people need that to, in order to sell books, you know, and, and theories and papers. I prefer to, to work peacefully, and people will say after if I am right or not. Father de Vaux is also said to have applied a Christian frame of reference to Qumran in describing it as a monastery. And de Vaux says very clearly, I never use this word in my books, and I never, never. Because people say, oh, you are a Dominican, you are a monk, and you try to uh, uh, bring everything in your side. And I said, no, sorry. I never use it because it would be extrapolation, you know, from the Christian point of view in a Jewish one. But surprisingly, despite 50 years of scholarship, it has not been proved beyond a doubt that the jars found in the hills above Qumran had anything to do with the community below. Nor has it been proved that the sect itself was an Essene community. In their writings, the sect did not refer to itself as Essene, and there is no mention of Qumran. But a large proportion of the scrolls deal with the rules of a community very similar to the description of the Essenes left by Josephus, who wrote only a decade after the destruction of their community. He wrote that the Essenes, for whom he had great admiration, were a celibate group recruiting promising young men from the cities. He said that once they were accepted, they underwent a period of initiation and finally were admitted to the community after they'd surrendered all their property. Then they were given white linen garments 
a hatchet, and permitted to take part in the ritual meals and prayers. He wrote that they bathed themselves, took daily communal meals, and had readings from sacred texts. They work assiduously till an hour before noon, when they again meet in one place and, donning linen loincloths, wash all over with cold water. The archaeological excavations made by Father DeVoe seem to conform to the descriptions left by Josephus. For example, the site itself contains many ritual baths and rooms thought to have been the refectory and the library. The people of the sect who left Jerusalem had invented these community meals every afternoon. And before they went to the mill, they went down the, to this ritual bath in order to emerge. In this small room, just south of the ritual bath, they found, Devo had found, the largest assembly of pottery ever found in Israel. In this area, they found 708 cups, 210 plates. Now, the number of the vessels that were lying here gives us a hint to the size of the community. I just came out from the room which usually are being identified as the room where the scroll was copied, because inkwells and tables were found here. Here, most of the scrolls were kept until the Roman army approached the site, and then they took the scrolls and took it from here to K4. But the most spectacular find of all was in this soft marl above Qumran. Hidden here by unknown hands was an enormous quantity of documents. In September of 1952, the Bedouins had found the cave which is underneath me. They found there 15,000 fragments. Those 15,000 fragments belong to 530 scrolls. Some scrolls, there are 250 pieces, and some scrolls, only one fragment has preserved. But basically, most of the scrolls found in Kumwan were found underneath the place that I'm standing right now. Jerusalem plays a major role in this story. For centuries, since the destruction of the Second Temple, Jerusalem has been a city divided by religion and conquered and occupied by great forces. Here in East Jerusalem is the Rockefeller Museum, originally a gift to the Kingdom of Jordan, now the headquarters of the Israel Antiquities Authority. And it is from here that many answers to the secrets of the scrolls may be traced. This trail begins with the restoration of the scrolls. Since their discovery, the major scrolls have darkened and deteriorated. Now, in the laboratories of the Antiquities Authority, a crucial battle is being waged for their preservation. These women are highly skilled paper and picture restorers, emigres from Moscow and St. Petersburg, and they're working on the urgent task of preserving the most precious documents in the possession of the Jewish state. When they first emerged from the dryness of the caves, the scrolls suffered different fates. Some were cut up and sold as fragments, Four were acquired by a cleric, advertised anonymously for sale in the Wall Street Journal, and bought by Israel. But gradually, most of the scrolls and fragments arrived here at the Rockefeller, in a variety of containers, including matchboxes and shoeboxes. Now it is all too apparent that the years of display and earlier attempts at restoration have taken their toll. Yeah. 
Нет, это просто капелька чернила. Ну, это достаточно прочно все, я считаю, что это, это вообще не страшно. Панина Шоу, директор консервации в Израиле Антиквитис Authority, concerned about how best to preserve them. With the scrolls, every day is a new experience. And of course, there's a routine that you go into, but whenever we stop to think what we're doing, it gets us all very exciting. Hers has been a heavy responsibility to ensure that the Dead Sea Scrolls may be read in all their glory in the coming millennia. We feel it's a, it's a sacred work. I mean, we feel the excitement every time, over and over again. Мне нравятся эти вещи. Я думаю о том, сколько сколько им лет. Я думаю о том, сколько им лет, и о тех людях, которые когда-то давно это писали. Может быть, это были наши предки. Наверняка даже. Я работала э, в Москве э, с памятниками большого исторического и художественного значения. Это были рукописи на пергаменте, но не такие древние, как свитки. И, и, и тогда мне тоже было интересно, и я любила свою работу. Я не могу сказать, что в этом плане что-то изменилось. Я понимаю, что это то, с чем мы сейчас работаем, это бесценные вещи, это памятники, сравнить ценность которых очень трудно, трудно их приравнять к чему-то. This particular scroll is called Peshach Havakuk. It's one of the non-canonical books of uh, the Bible. Mm -hmm. There's areas that have been touched and retouched again and again, but otherwise it's in very good condition, comparatively, and it's a beautiful piece. The scrolls are unique. Never uh, has such an amount of material been found. When they were first found, the different fragments were scotch taped together by the scholars in order to be able to read them. They then put them in between two glass plates so that they wouldn't move. That was their way of preserving them. Eventually, it turns out that the pressure of the plates on the fragments, on the sellotape, is disastrous. All of the residues of the sellotape penetrated into the fragments, and we're now in a state where we slowly take off the sellotape and the residues that have penetrated into the parchment. If we don't, eventually the fragments themselves or the parchment itself will just disintegrate. But out of their cases and frames, the extraordinary detail and beauty of the scrolls can be appreciated for the first time. The scroll bindings made separately, the lines made on the parchment to guide the authors, and the corrections written above the lines can be seen clearly 2,000 years later. This is one of the Thanksgiving Psalms. These Psalms were probably sung daily by the members of the community. This one thanks God for personal salvation and election. You have supported me in steadfast faithfulness, and with your Holy Spirit, you delighted me. While some scrolls have darkened because of the residues, others were damaged in different ways. The temple scroll, hidden under floorboards in Bethlehem for many years, was damaged by moisture, but it is too thin and fragile to be restored as planned. It is the longest of the Dead Sea Scrolls, at 28 feet. This scroll is an attempt by the authors 
to lay down systematically the rules for temple sacrifice and observance, as well as a description of the rebuilt temple which would come about at the end of days. It is a priceless document, but its state is causing alarm. Now a professor of chemistry and an outside conservation expert have been called in to advise. We have to try to figure out uh, why the darkening of the uh, scrolls is still continuing and do some uh, simulation experiments to find out what the process is all about. The better we know about the process, the better we can preserve whatever is remain legible. Very often uh, we come to conclusions that it's better to leave it as it is in a good surrounding, in, a, in an atmosphere of neutral uh, uh, conditions in which uh, we can avoid uh, further deterioration of the, the scroll. And, uh, and to leave it as it is, and maybe the, the next generation will be cleverer. <laughs> In the end, they decide not to reverse the previous conservation work, as the scroll is too delicate. But the restoration has provided one great opportunity to allow scientists to inspect the major scrolls while they're in the process of conservation. Research is being carried out in many areas while science tries to fill in the gaps in the scholars' and archaeologists' knowledge. Drawing on various disciplines from police forensics to chemical analysis. The aim is to try to tie the Essenes to the scrolls found in Qumran. This is the material, the coating or the krug that was found on the scrolls that was cleaned off. In this, as we can see, we have material like insect exoskeleton, we've got fibers, plant parts in here, we have ins more insect parts. I'm looking at a white fiber, which I'll remove from the dirt and then subject to further analysis. This could tell me that the people that worked on the scrolls wore linen garments. This little piece of forensic evidence, this little white thread, lends weight to the theory that these are Essene documents, because Josephus says that they habitually wore white linen. Image enhancement also reveals new evidence. Josephus said that among the Essenes, married men were required to put aside their wives for a trial period. This fragment, readable for the first time under UV light, seems to confirm that this was a rule of the community. A lot of the scrolls that we're working on are actually unreadable to the unaided eye, and it became apparent early on that infrared photography was the only way to work with these. However, now with this equipment, we can actually change the lighting and, and get the fragments in the best position possible to read these otherwise unreadable letters. We have, for the first time, on a copy of the Rule of the Congregation, an injunction which says here, lo yikrav le ishto, meaning that the newcomer, when he joins in, shall no longer approach his wife, which is the first uh, confirmation we have in the scrolls that the Essenes uh, were enjoined to celibacy. The scrolls, which are mostly written on parchment made from the skins of goats, are also being tested to see if the DNA of one fragment matches the DNA of another. If two fragments found in different locations prove to have come from the same goat, it's clear that they belong together. We sampled 12 sheets of the temple scroll and one sheet, we sampled the sheet itself and one fragment that was attached to it in order to see whether the, the, the matching was correct. We extracted DNA, we got an answer that all the, the sheets of the temple scrolls has made out of domestic goat and what was interesting, the matching was correct because they belong to the same individual.
This headlouse is nearly 2,000 years old. It probably died in June 68 AD, 30 years after Jesus was crucified. Head lice have not changed in 2,000 years. They must feed every three and a half hours on human blood. So this head louse may well have come from the head of one of the last survivors of the community of Qumran, before he went out to hide the scrolls as the Roman legions approached. Now scientists are trying to extract DNA from this head louse. It may be possible to find the remains of its last meal. If this can be done successfully, it may also be possible to compare the DNA of the Qumran sect with known DNA of the same period, so providing direct access to these mysterious people. This louse was found in about 2,000 years old comb excavated in Qumran. The high uh, percentage of infested combs and the high number of lice we found in this comb show that lice were very prevalent at this time. The Rockefeller Museum may still hold clues. The scroll jars themselves contain vital evidence. For the first time, samples taken from one of these jars will be analyzed in a particle accelerator. The composition of the clay from the jars will then be compared to the clay from the ancient quarries of Qumran and Jerusalem. The basic premise is that there is no clay on earth with the exact chemical composition. So if you can uh, trace the pottery back to the clay source, you will be able to differentiate between different clay sources. And that's what we are going to do here. We are tracing this vessel back to the source from where it originally came. Establishing the origins of the jars is important because many scholars and archaeologists have suggested that the scrolls were taken from the temple in Jerusalem to the desert to hide them from the Romans before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. The amount of scrolls that were found in the caves near Qumran is so big that it showed that they were part of a library. And the libraries in this period, in the late Hellenistic, early Roman period, were all in cities like Alexandria, like Antioch, like Caesarea, and probably like in Jerusalem. And in this case, the scrolls probably came from Jerusalem just before the destruction of the temple. Jan Gunnarweg takes a sample of the mozza clay used for 3,000 years in the making of Jerusalem pottery. Gunnarweg also takes samples from a kiln at Qumran. Any link between the pottery of Qumran below and the clay of the jars found in the caves above will establish almost conclusively that the scrolls were hidden by the inhabitants of Qumran. It would be almost certain then that Qumran was destroyed by the Romans, the community dispersed and the scrolls left undisturbed for two millennia, as most scholars believe but no one has been able to prove conclusively. In fact, not all the archaeologists are agreed that Qumran was the major settlement of the Essenes. I think that Qumran was inhabited by one of the rich people of Judea, an aristocrat, who probably lived in uh, Jerusalem, and Qumran was a kind of manor house, was a center of an estate uh, for growing, of probably of balsam, to, in the production of uh, perfumes. And the only connection with people like the Essenes might be that the Essenes, the Essenes were the workers in the estate of Qumran. Dr. Hirschfeld believes that this site at Ein Gedi, further down the Dead Sea, was the true site of the Essenes, as described by Pliny. And so he calls these simple buildings cells, which suggests a monkish life. But there are also other theories about the origin of the jars. It has even been suggested that this part bearing the words Roma in Hebrew 
brought the Gospels from Rome to an early Christian community. This jar is important because uh, it, has, it bears the name Roma. It is the Resh, the Waf, the Mem and the Aleph. There are some people who think that the jar was imported from Rome. No? Uh, what we can prove and do in analyzing this jar is to prove whether it was made on the spot in Qumran itself or in fact it was imported from somewhere and perhaps even Rome. Other theorists are eager to suggest that Qumran was an early Christian establishment and that the teacher of righteousness was Jesus or James. A number of scholars believe that the teacher of righteousness was a deposed high priest from Jerusalem. The massive tombs of the priestly families in the Kidron Valley just outside the walls of Jerusalem are reminders of their great wealth and power. It is likely that the teacher of righteousness left Jerusalem in the wake of a dynastic struggle for control of the temple and its revenues. But the scrolls provide no hard evidence for the identity of the teacher of righteousness. However, examination of the Roma part will help confirm whether or not it's possible that the teacher of righteousness could have been an early Christian. I think that the great problem is when the people try to identify some specific characters mentioned in the scrolls as Christian characters or as uh, characters uh, mentioned in the New Testament. But they don't uh, feel that we have to do that in order to understand the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls for the understanding or study of uh, the origin of the church. Because when you realize that the first Christians were Jews and the Dead Sea Scrolls, they shed light on Jewish society and Second Temple Judaism, so it's so clear that even without saying that Jesus was part of Qumran, even then, the Dead Sea Scrolls are very significant for the understanding of Christianity because the first Christians were part of Jewish society in those days. Anyone who has this sort of conspiratorial mentality thinks, well, the gospel story may be cooked up. Here we have material coming from outside the Christian tradition. Maybe it throws special light on it, and then so when it doesn't turn to that turn, turn out to throw any special light, in those terms of, of the central affirmations of Christianity, did Jesus live, did he die on the cross, and so on, then they say, oh, well, there really was information there, but someone hid it. The scrolls themselves talk of the battles of the great teacher of righteousness who led the community into the wilderness with the teacher of lies. The Habakkuk commentary interprets the words of the prophet as the teacher's struggles with the priests of Jerusalem. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnants of the peoples shall plunder you. Interpreted, this concerns the last priests of Jerusalem who shall amass money and wealth by plundering the peoples. And the Thanksgiving Psalms found in Cave 1 suggest the great schisms in Judaism. Teachers of lies have banished me from my land like a bird from its nest. They withhold from the thirsty the drink of knowledge and assuage their thirst with vinegar. Amazingly, 50 years after the excavation of Qumran, important new clues still lie right here in this cemetery. Physical anthropologist Joe Zayas wonders why some graves are placed on a north-south axis and some, where the women and children were found, face east-west. The bones from the original DeVoe excavation are lost and at the insistence of the religious authorities, it is forbidden to excavate Jewish burial sites. The fact that women and children were found buried here is important because Josephus said of the Essenes, scorning wedlock, they select other men's children while still pliable and teachable and fashion them after their own pattern. Not that they wish to do away with marriage as a means of continuing the human race, 
but they are afraid of the promiscuity of women and convinced that none of the sex remains faithful to one man. If Qumran is an Essene community, as described by Josephus, a community which recruited young men only in the cities and from which women were excluded, then you would expect to find men only in the cemetery. Yet when DeVoe excavated the site, as his notebooks tell us, the bones of women and children were found in the cemetery to the southeast. It is the notebooks of uh, Father DeVoe when he was excavating at Qumran. And it is uh, interesting to, to check that uh, he was uh, uh, doing a correspondence be between the uh, description of the tomb and some uh, rough uh, drawings of the tombs with the skeleton inside. After that, you have uh, some estimation of male or female and age and so on. This has puzzled scholars for 50 years. Joe Zayas now suspects that there have been two different eras of burial by two different peoples. What I would like to do is to take a look at the human skeletal remains. If these things here are of recent origin, if they're intrusive, one of the things you're going to see is you're going to see big differences in preservation. Somebody who's been in the ground 2,000 years in terms of preservation is completely different from someone who's been in the ground for 500, 600, 700 years. Night is falling over Jerusalem. In his apartment, Jan Gunnarveig gets his results back from the neutron activator in Hungary. From his vast database, he's able to compare the chemical composition of the pots with the chemical composition of the clay quarries of Israel. As he scans the results, the news is truly startling. The Roman jar has been proven by the data I just get back over here that it is made on the spot in Qumran itself. It is not important from anywhere. No, this jar was made in Qumran. And that is a fact. The scroll jars found in the caves have all the same chemical composition. And they have nothing to do with anything what we have analyzed from Jerusalem itself. No? And we have analyzed materials from the 9th century BC until the destruction of the temple and later again the Arabic period. So we have covered, let me say, something like 2,000 uh, years of pottery making in Jerusalem. It doesn't analyze as uh, material from Jerusalem. This means that the scroll jars did not come from Jerusalem. And if they did not come from Jerusalem, the scrolls were not transported in them from Jerusalem. In all probability, the scrolls were moved in their jars from the library in Qumran to the caves as the Romans approached. This simple experiment has settled one of the major debates surrounding the Dead Sea Scrolls. And whatever the significance of the Hebrew letters on the Roma jar, they do not signify that the jar came from Rome or that there is any connection with Christianity. A small paper published in an academic journal has brought exciting news. By chance, skeletons taken from the site in the 1950s to a location in Germany where all trace of them was lost have been found in the care of a German scientist who kept them after a university department wanted to throw them away. Hello, hello, shalom, it's Joe from Jerusalem. Hello, Joe, come up. Okay, I'm coming. Today, these precious bones are going to be inspected in Munich by Josias. From the skeletons, he'll be able to determine the makeup of the community. Zayas knows that among the bones in Germany are the skeletons of women and children. But he wants to test his theory that these bones are of a much later date. Here are the boxes. Yes, sir. 
Um, this uh, this is from Qumran, from the graves from Qumran, without the collection Kurt. I've been waiting 25 years to see this material from Qumran. <laughs> ah, do you know what's interesting about this? You see? At the time of death, the person was wearing an earring. Uh, yes, an earring. Uh, from bronze. From bronze, or some yes. cheap metal. Certainly yeah. wasn't gold, <laughs> that's for sure. Mm -hmm. No, it's very clear here. Yes, yeah, very clear. And here, you can see... It is of crucial importance, because he knows that if women and children were buried there at the same time as the men, then Qumran is almost certainly not the site of an Essene community, a fact which would be a terrible blow for scholars and archaeologists alike. Wow. This is, uh, this is from Devo? This is from Devo. This is here, and then, then you can see the child. When I looked at the material from the main cemetery, this is sort of typical material which we see after 2,000 years. There's a tremendous amount of restoration just in this one skull here. When we look at the margins of the cemetery, is it, what do we find? We find material which is in an incredible state of preservation. My first reaction was, we are looking at two completely different populations. Once I start looking at the teeth, here's an individual here. This is an adult male in his 20s. The teeth which are missing here, unfortunately, were lost or sometime during the process of archaeological excavation. But look here, we can still see that the teeth are in a very good state of preservation. If we go and compare this mandible here, and here's one of these typical desert mandibles, what do we see here? First of all, the front teeth and we can, we can see that they're almost all gone at a very early age. The other thing, which is the real critical factor here, is look at the dentition. And we can, we can see the dentition, which is already wearing through. This is from eating a diet which is heavily involved with sand. You have a glass of water, you get sand. You have something to eat, you get sand. You have something, fruit, vegetable, what do you get? Sand. As a result, the attrition rate in, in these people coming out from the desert is twice that of someone who was living in the areas of the highlands. I can't tell you where this man came from, but one thing I can tell you is that he didn't come from Qumran. Not only has Zayas concluded that the bones of women and children discovered in the cemetery are Arab bones of a much later date, but the jewelry discovered in the graves and neglected in the Rockefeller Museum has been shown to be 12th century Arab jewelry. Joe Zeiss's hunch was correct. Bedouin buried their dead in the cemetery, and the original cemetery was exclusively male. We can now say with confidence that Qumran is the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were studied and composed, and then hidden in jars in caves. We can also say that Qumran was the site of the Essene settlement as described by Josephus nearly 2,000 years ago. This barren and deserted place has had a profound influence on Jewish and Christian thought. The dead who lie in this cemetery, only a few hundred souls, studied the Bible, interpreted it, copied it, and tried to live a life of piety and purity in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah and the end of days. For the Christian and Jewish worlds in particular, it is a story full of significance, and it is a continuing source of wonder and speculation. Some mysteries have been dispelled, but there is also a remaining mystery. What happened to the Essenes after the community came so abruptly to an end? The physical sciences will undoubtedly lead us still closer to the Essenes, perhaps by way of ancient DNA. And then we may know for certain what happened to them. For the moment, it appears most likely that when the community came to an end, its members were reabsorbed into the traditions of Judaism. In the early years of Christianity, it's probable that Essenes, Christians, and other Jewish sects were living side by side and debating the great religious issues. Only later, as Rabbinic Judaism and Christianity became dominant, only then was the influence of the Essenes lessened and finally forgotten. 
What I find very exciting is the research on the scrolls is an ongoing process. Most of the people, they think that all the story ended up in the 50s, and since then, no more scrolls uh, uh, we, we have in hands. And today, it's quite clear that, like in this case, we can get new material, shedding a new light on Jewish societies and to understand all the different groups who lived in the land of Israel 2,000 years ago. Meanwhile, at the Rockefeller Museum, work goes on with the delicate task of preservation, as it has done for years and will do for many more. I'm not sure how impressive this piece is to you, but to us, because of its grievous state, we find it quite an achievement. We've had months of research before starting the work on it. The first aim of the painstaking and skilled restoration is to make sure that the scrolls do not deteriorate further on display, and that the effects of previous conservation work the penetration of the scrolls by chemicals from the sticking tape is halted. But it is also a task of great symbolic importance to preserve the visible and physical links with a distant but still resonant past. We have managed to clean it and uh, strengthen it as much as possible. A section of the Thanksgiving Psalms is now readied for display. And we're now putting it in between two layers of stable text, which protects it. And then we don't sew the scroll itself, we sew all around the edges so that it doesn't move. The stitching alone of this one section takes two days. For 2,000 years, the Essenes was a lost voice until the discovery and study of the Dead Sea Scrolls brought them to life and their enduring influence was understood. A library of what seems to be about 800 books, 800 documents, is an absolutely extraordinary find from a period where if we had a scrap of papyrus with a few words of Deuteronomy on it, we thought we had really got something. Anything that teaches us more about the origins of these two religious traditions, which are happily called today the Judeo-Christian tradition. Anything that can give us more information about how Christianity developed, how Judaism transformed itself into something else, is, is of inestimable value. The people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls may have disappeared, but their legacy endures for all time. <laughs>